Здравствуйте, Новосибирск. That gets better. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dylan Beatty. Uh, thank you very much, CodeFest, for inviting me to come out and, and speak to you this afternoon. Um, a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, this is me. Uh, I'm based in London in the UK. I'm the CTO at a company there called Skills Matter, who are a training and conference provider company. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP for Visual Studio and development tools. And I've been building websites basically forever. I built my first website all the way back in 1992, which is like forever in internet years. Anyone here born after 1992? Yeah, I've been building websites since longer than you're alive. So it's okay, you know, you've learned to walk and talk and read and write and code and graduated university. We've gone from HTML2 to HTML5. You're winning. <laughs> Um, and yes, uh, as you've noticed, I will be speaking to you this afternoon in English. Я не говорю по-русски. Еще. I am learning. There is a course on, do you know Duolingo? This uh, application you use on your phone to help you learn languages. So I, I downloaded this, this Russian course, um, and it's teaching me some things which are not useful for giving technical talks. Вы должны вибрать тот или смерть. I think this one's about SharePoint. Anyway, so our talk begins a long time ago in a continent far, far away. Uh, that's where I was born, Kenya in Africa in the late 1970s. My father is from England, and when I was born, he wanted to take a picture of me to send to his family back home. So he took this photograph. This is me when I was small with my mum. She's the one on the left. And he put the picture in an envelope with a letter, and he sent it in the post to his parents in Oxford in the United Kingdom. Um, it took about four weeks to get there. Now, this is one photograph, so 250 kilobytes, maybe, if you scanned this. Four weeks for 250 kilobytes is, well, about 10 seconds per bit. You talk about gigabit and megabit networks, we're talking about millibit networks here. You know, we're talking, this was a big deal. Sending a photograph to somebody in another country was so expensive that you only did it when somebody was born or there was a wedding or somebody graduated from university. But today, we can send pictures just flying around the world, you know, in seconds. We do this all the time. Anyone have a cat? Anyone got a cat at home? You ever get your partner send you pictures of the cat for no reason? Like, you know, you're just sat there and your phone goes bing. And, you know, the cat didn't graduate university or get married. The cat's just looking kind of goofy. And that's enough now for us to send a photograph flying around the world at the speed of light. And it's completely normal. This is Lionel, by the way. This is my girlfriend's cat. He's going to crop up throughout this talk. Um, but, you know, we don't even stop to think about it anymore. It's absolutely amazing. And so what I want to do today is... I want to actually deconstruct all of the technology and innovation that we as human beings had to invent for us to be able to do this. I'm going to strip everything right down to the physics at the bottom of the stack and build it back up again. So I'm going to start here. It's me. I'm here in uh, Novosibirsk. My phone is online, and I know it's online. If I take it out and look at it, I see those four little bars in the corner. Uh, by the way, just, just show of hands, how many people here are on this network and have their phone in the room? That's probably, what, 20, 30, 40 people? Okay, what do those bars actually mean? Well, what they mean is that my phone handset has established a two-way radio connection with a mobile phone tower, what we call a base station, and there's a whole load of them up on the roof because I can see them out of my hotel window. But what does that mean? Now, start with the simplest thing of all, start with radio. This is an antenna. It's a piece of wire. That's all it is. It's just a piece of metal wire. We're going to run an electric current up it, and when we do that, it is going to transmit radio waves. And if we put another piece of wire near it, that wire will pick up the radio waves and we'll get the electric current back out. This is basically transmitting electricity wirelessly. Now, we didn't invent this. We just discovered it. This is just kind of the way that our universe works. And as soon as we discovered this, people started thinking, hey, you know, we could do cool things with this. Why don't we put a really big tower up on top of the hill, and
And then anybody who's got a, you know, a little transistor radio set with an amplifier and a speaker in it will be able to listen to music and the news and broadcasts and all this kind of stuff. And you know, nowadays, this seems really old fashioned. But this was a big deal when this happened. Before this, you wanted to talk to somebody. You had to walk to where they were and, and talk to them, you know? And it's actually interesting. During the, the 1980s, when home computers used to load games off cassette, cassette tape, there were a couple of places in the world where radio shows would actually broadcast computer games. They'd be a show, and they'd have you know music, and they'd interview people. They'd talk about programming and stuff. And then the DJ would say, OK, everybody, put your tape in and press record. Go silent. You'd record for about 20 minutes. And if you were lucky, and you had a good signal, and the tape didn't run out, you'd have literally downloaded a game off the radio. Which, you know, I think this is it's one of those weird little quirks, but I think it's really, really cool that they were able to do this. But, you know, there is a big, big difference between downloading an 8-bit copy of Tetris or Pac-Man off the radio and the kind of data networking requirements that we need for modern cell phone applications. There's actually three key differences, three problems we needed to solve to make radio networks usable. One of them, uh, mobile networks need to be two-way. Radio is a broadcast medium. You know when you're using like a walkie-talkie or uh, um, you know, like an intercom system, and somebody says, yeah, this is Dylan to Codefest, over, and then you have to release? Because they can't talk while you're talking. It only works in one direction at a time. But you don't want to do that with your phone. You want to be able to send and receive simultaneously. You want to be able to have phone calls. You want to be able to send and receive, upload and download data at the same time. So that's one problem we needed to solve. We need to solve the problem that radio is a broadcast medium. I don't want the roof of this building broadcasting my email to everybody who's listening. And anyone can just tune their phone in and go, oh, look at that, cat pictures. You know? So we need to solve that problem. And then we needed to solve the problem that we need a lot more bandwidth than you can get through FM radio. Now, cellular data, signal processing, this kind of stuff is incredibly complex. There's an unbelievable amount of clever stuff going on. We only have 30 minutes this afternoon. So if anyone really wants to know about it, come and find me afterwards or in the bar later, and I can talk you through all of the mathematics and mechanics behind it. But basically what's important for the purpose of this talk, mobile data uses something called a cellular network. Instead of having one big transmitter up on top of the hill that broadcasts right over the entire city, what they did was to break it down into cells. This is where we get the term like cell phones and cell radio and stuff. And these cell stations, because of the high frequency we're using, they have a much shorter range. In busy cities, you'll find a base station every few hundred meters, because each base station can only cope with maybe 100 telephone handsets. So right now, all of us in here with our um, iPhones and our Android phones and everything, we're probably maxing out the towers on the roof of this building. But that's OK, because there's about six or seven towers up there. I know, I checked. There's also you know, this limit on range. The effective range of one of these base stations is probably about 10 kilometers. But if there's more than 100 people within 10 kilometers, you're going to need another one. So this first problem we had to solve. You switch your phone on. It comes up searching. What that means, your phone is scanning through these frequencies. It's about 900 megahertz, 1800 megahertz, and it's trying to find one that's strong enough to lock onto. And when it finds one, it does a very complicated handshake with that cell phone tower. It says, hey, this is me. I need two frequencies. I need one to receive, and I need one to transmit. And please, can you encrypt them so that no one else can listen to them in transit? And by the way, I've got a 4G network plan or 4G SIM card, so I'm going to need a really, really good clear frequency so I can send 100 megabits of data up and downstream over this wireless protocol. And it's only possible because of you know, this incredibly sophisticated set of innovations and components and algorithms and technology. No one ever has to tune your phone. You, know, you don't have to, to take a little dial and fix in the frequency. All this stuff is built into the network, the layers, the handsets, the software, the operating system. And all we as developers have to do, if we look at the pseudocode for a simple messaging app that you can run on your phone, there's probably a couple of lines of code in it that look like this. While true, check for messages. You know, We don't need to worry about the frequency. We don't need to worry what cell we're in, what the network provider is. All of this stuff's been abstracted for us. All we do is we keep pinging, checking for messages, checking for messages. Now, when we do that, our check for messages is sitting on top of probably HTTP, which is the kind of standard protocol now for doing API-based cloud services. 
And that's encrypted. We've got some industrial strength encryption and certificates going on there to make sure no one can intercept our HTTP traffic. That's sat on top of the thing called the TCP layer, transport layer. This is a way of breaking our request down into packets. Underneath that, there's a thing called IP, the internet protocol. Now, the amazing thing is that TCP is a guaranteed delivery protocol. It guarantees that if I send you 200 network packets, you will receive all of them in the same order that I sent them. But IP is not. IP is just throws them on the wire and waits to see what happens. So we've managed to build a guaranteed delivery protocol on top of an unreliable protocol. Underneath that, there is this thing called the link layer. The link layer is what gets those packets physically from here to the router. And then the router uses the link layer to get them to the backbone. And the backbone uses them to bounce them all the way around the world and out into the mobile phone base station on the other side. And then underneath that, there's 4G and LTE, which are these comms protocols built into the radio system. And then underneath that, there's the whole infrastructure that supports cellular networking. And underneath that, there is this fundamental innovation we call radio. It's easier just to say it works by magic. Because, no, this stuff is, there's this, this lovely quote, Arthur C. Clarke, who was a British science fiction writer. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, even when you know how this stuff works, I still think it's amazing that all of this technology exists. It exists everywhere in the world. And all we need to do to take advantage of it is just write one little line of code, check for messages, you know, ping, web request, download. You know, I think that's absolutely amazing. So next time you pull your phone out your pocket and you've only got two bars of signal, don't go, <laughs> think about it. Think about everything that had to happen to get those two little bars onto your screen. OK, so we've got our four bars of signal. Someone has just sent me this funny cat picture. And now, you know, we've got that one simple line of code, check for messages, return true. Now we need to play the alert sound. There we go. Doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? It's like half a second of audio. Now, audio is pressure waves in the air. Human ears are incredibly good at detecting pressure waves in air. The human ear is an incredibly sensitive instrument. So to make that ping noise, what we need to do is take an electric current, push it through a coil that's wrapped around a magnet that's inside our phone attached to this tiny, tiny little aluminum loudspeaker about the size of a fingernail. And that moves enough air that your ear will go, ooh, ping, I need to check my phone. Now, Signal technology and audio technology is analog. You know, We're human beings. We deal in waves and volume and noises and light and shade. We don't deal in bits. We don't deal in ones and zeros. And when you look at a waveform, so this is an audio waveform. What this literally is is a set of instructions for how to move the loudspeaker. Move it forwards, move it backwards. Forwards, backwards. That's what creates the waveform. That's what we hear. But to get this to come out of our phone, you know, vinyl record players, those are analog. Cassette players, analog. FM radio, analog. Anyone here got a phone with a, a vinyl turntable in it? Cassette player? FM radio? Maybe one or two. Phones are digital. Modern technology is all digital. Digital is about numbers and ones and zeros. So we need a way to turn this nice smooth curve into a string of numbers. Now, the standard way we do that is we measure the height of the wave at intervals. That's it. Or we need to know what position was the loudspeaker or the microphone in at the exact instant we sampled it. And there are two key numbers that affect how good the sound is. One of them is something called a sampling frequency. The other one is something called the precision. Frequency, how often are we measuring that signal? Compact disc audio, you'll look on the back of a CD packet, you'll see two numbers there. 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz. What this means, 44,100 times every second, the CD or the, the sampling equipment that used to make CDs and most digital audio files is measuring the intensity of that sound wave, and it's doing it using 16 bits of precision. So that's a number somewhere between 0 and, anyone want to shout the answer? 262,000 something? So that's an awful lot of precision. You know, We have these very, very precise values to measure what that sound is doing. We do that, we measure the sound, we take that stream of numbers, we store the numbers in an audio file, right? Well, yeah, kind of, but we haven't invented file storage yet. We've got this string of numbers that represent the sound. Well, we have nowhere to keep it. We need to invent a file system. And before we can invent a file system, we need to invent a way that we can store a bit. We can write down the value of a single bit, a one or a zero, and then we can go away 
and then we can come back later. Which, you know, we kind of take for granted, but somebody had to invent this. And the earliest storage systems used physical hard drives. You had a spinning platter, 15,000 revolutions per minute, covered in a magnetic substrate, covered in tiny, tiny particles, and you have this head. This has been slowed down 40 times so you can see what's happening. If this is happening at real time, you'd just be a blur. You wouldn't be able to see anything at all. And that head has an electromagnet in it that is reading literally hundreds of millions of those bits off that disk every second. That's what disk read speed really meant in the days of mechanical disks, is how fast can that head scan across the spinning piece of metal and read and write and read and write by switching this electromagnet on and off. Now, the big problem with these is, one, they have moving parts. Two, they're fragile. They use a lot of heat. Oh, they use a lot of power. They generate a lot of heat. And if you drop one, you get what's called a disk crash. And then you have to go and buy a new hard drive, because they're not terribly robust. But we fundamentally had this way of writing a series of bits, going away for a while, coming back later, and finding the bits that we stored. The earliest hard drive systems, literally, they used a thing called a file allocation table, which is still around today. The earliest file allocation table was literally the name of the file and the physical address on one of those disks where you could go and find that stream of bytes and the length. How long was the stream that you saved there? Now, you know, this is a good idea, but you don't, this is not going to do cat pictures on mobile phones at the speed of light halfway around the planet. We had to invent flash memory. Now, the brilliant thing about flash memory, you know, we've had memory for years and years and years. The problem with memory is if you switch the power off, it goes, it gets wiped, completely erased. You have a power failure, you've not just lost your work, you've lost your entire hard drive, all your apps, all your programs, that NPM install pipeline you spent last week working on, it's gone. So, we, uh, it was Toshiba who came up with the, the first, what they call non-volatile RAM. This is memory that you can put val write values into it, take the power away, and it will remember what values you put in there, so when you power it up later. And the way it works, it's basically a grid, a couple of hundred million of these things in a tiny, tiny silicon wafer. And each of these cells, they're arranged in a grid pattern, just like this one, and they have address lines. They have grids, rows, and they have columns. And when the row and the column intersect, we can write a value into that cell. And the way we write a value is we take a bunch of electrons, and we trick them into getting stuck inside this tiny, tiny layer of silicon oxide. And then we take the power away, and the electrons stay there. I think that's amazing, you know? And you can come back later, you reapply power, the value will be persisted. It's based on, this, as I said, this grid and column addressing system. And flash memory is a game changer. It's faster than, solids, than uh, mechanical drives. It's cheaper. It's lighter. It doesn't get damaged when you knock it. It is absolutely perfect for putting in something like a cell phone, which is going to get knocked around and left in pockets and you know, knocked off tables and all this kind of stuff. And do you know what we developers need to do to take advantage of this incredible technology that's literally pushing the boundaries of physics? We go file.read, and we give it a file name. And the magic happens. That gets turned into this string of bits, and the string of bits gets turned into this digital waveform. The digital wave gets turned back into an analog wave. The analog wave gets turned back into a sound. <coughs> And there he is, you know. But I got a picture. How did the picture get there? How did we capture and send this photograph? Now, you know, we're talking about human brains. We work in terms of, of waves, light and shade and dark and noise and all these kinds of things. Machines, computers, phones, networks are digital. And so we need a way of taking this pattern of colors and light and shade and turning that into a sequence of numbers. Now, the way that we can do this, first we need the sun, or you know, a lamp or something. Light comes out of sun, light bounces off Lionel. Uh, the reason Lionel looks orange is that Lionel absorbs blue light and green light, which is why only the red light bounces off. It bounces into this thing. This is the lens on your phone handset. The lens focuses it onto this thing. This is a CMOS light receptor. If you've got an 8 megapixel phone, there are 8 million of these tiny, tiny sensors. Every one of them is an electrical component that, if you shine light on it, it will emit voltage. And you can read how much light is falling on it. Now, these things only work in black and white. They can only do grayscale. So we invented this incredibly sophisticated pattern of red and green and blue filters so that even though all we're picking up is light and dark intensity, we can recreate the colors that actually went into the original image. So. When you press the shutter on your camera phone, 
you are capturing eight million photo detectors. Each one of them is giving you three values, a red value, a green value, and a blue value. Red, green, and blue are the components of visible light. And we're probably storing each of those with eight bits of precision per channel. So eight million pixels, 24 bits of information per pixel. Anyone want to do the maths? 192 million bits, 24 megabytes for this picture. Now, that's not a lot. But here in Russia, roaming data for me costs four pounds for 40 megabytes. That's about, what, 400, 420 rubles? Um, so this uncompressed picture of Lionel will cost me 200 rubles. And a beer and a bar here costs, what, about 80? So if I can compress this image by 50%, I can get a beer. And if I can compress it even more, I can get two beers, maybe even three beers. So let's do some science. <laughs> now, there is a whole range of formats and algorithms and compression techniques that are used to compress images in all sorts of ways. Um, the one we're going to talk about today is the most popular. It's kind of a de facto standard. It's the one that's been used all over the web. It's called JPEG. It's Joint Photographic Experts Group. Now, you know, JPEG files, they're ubiquitous. We all deal with them every day. But there's actually an astonishingly sophisticated set of algorithms that go into how JPEG works. Now, um, unfortunately, I can't use this picture of Lionel to demonstrate because it's already been compressed, so I can't show you the difference. But this is a public domain picture that's on Wikipedia, and I'm going to use this just to talk you through what actually happens when we use JPEG compression on an image. First thing, when we captured this, we captured three channels, red, green, blue. There's actually lots of different ways of representing an image as separate channels of values. And the model that JPEG uses is it uses a model called, for some reason, YCBCR. Y stands for lightness. Why? I don't know why. It just does. So this is basically light and dark. This is how light and how dark the image is. And then we have two channels. One gives you a balance between blue and yellow. The other one gives you a balance between red and green. The reason it does this is we humans are much, much better at seeing light and dark than we are at seeing colors. So the first thing we can do is we can throw away almost all of the precision information from those colored channels. We can downsample them. We can throw away, JPEG throws away 75% of the pixels in the colored channels. And your mind just fills them back in because it can see the light and dark and it guesses at what should be there. That's awesome, you know, 75%. We've just gone from 24 megs to 12 megs. Just by throwing away color information, we've earned our first beer. Yeah? Now, the next thing we want to do is work out how we can squash what's left to get that down even smaller. We're still thirsty. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to zoom in on one tiny element of this picture, because JPEG works in tiny, tiny, tiny tiles, one at a time, then it sticks them all back together. We're going to zoom right in on the ridge of the roof. We're going to take a slice through it. So just one row of pixels. And we're going to imagine what happens if we take that row of pixels and we plot it as a wave. So. You can see here, we've got this, this spot where it dips down right in the middle, corresponds to the dark area here. This peak here corresponds to the light area there. The reason that we want to do this is down to a guy called Joseph Fourier. He's a French mathematician, and Fourier made this amazing observation that any wave, almost any pattern, any shape, can be reproduced by breaking it down into lots of small, simple waves and gluing them all together. Now, this is a demonstration of how to recreate a square wave using really simple orbiting sine wave patterns. We start off with the primary wave. That's not square. So we're going to add another layer to it. And then we're going to add another one on top of that. And then we're going to add another one on top of that. And I think this is magic. Because by doing this, we can take a signal, we can take a waveform. It's how MP3 works. It's how JPEG compression works. It's how MPEG compression works. They turn these images into a series of waves, and then they break those waves down into fundamental, simple waves that give you the ingredients you need to reconstitute them. So we're going to take one tiny slice, this little 8 by 8 pixel square here. Now, what we need to do, we need to create a recipe for recreating this tile. And the point about recipes, you know, you're making any kind of recipe, some ingredients are more important than others. So here is a recipe for shchi. Yeah? yeah that, there's that uh, saying, shchi da kasha pisha nasha. Yeah? 
and there's a bunch of different ingredients in shchi. <laughs> You know, you've got to have meat and cabbage and carrots and onions. If you leave those out, it's not shi. You know, you, you, you've broken it. But then there's a bunch of ingredients here that maybe they're good, but you don't need them. So we could leave out the salt and pepper, yeah? And maybe we can leave out the garlic and the bay leaves. And we've achieved 39% compression. And what we've got, you know, it's lossy compression. This isn't the best shi you've ever had, but it's still shi, you know? And maybe if you're hungry, your brain will just fill in the different bits. That's how JPEG compression works. We throw away the bits that don't matter, and your brain fills them back in for you. Now, instead of using you know, meat and cabbage and potatoes, the ingredients for JPEG recipes are these 64 little tiny tiles here. These are baked into the JPEG specification. And what these represent, these are uh, basically they're, they're waves, sine waves. So this is a um, period zero, this is a blank. Then this one here is one wave, two waves, one and a half waves, two waves, two and a half, three, all the way down. So this bottom right, that's a checkerboard pattern. That's basically the most complicated pattern you can fit in an eight by eight pixel grid. And you can recreate any black and white tile by adding together these tiles in just the right proportions, just like making a recipe. So JPEG runs this incredibly complex bit of maths called a discrete cosine transform, which I'll tell you about in the pub later if you really want. And what that does, it tells us how much of each of the ingredients we need. Gives us all these different coefficients. Now, the couple of things you'll notice here. One, top left, this is the big one. This is important. This is the, you know, the cabbages and the meat if you're making shchi, or the, or the beetroot and the meat broth if you're making borscht. This is the ingredient you can't leave out, otherwise the whole thing won't work. But then down towards the bottom corner, these ones aren't so important. You know, if we're compressing hard, we can afford to throw some of those away. We do all this incredibly advanced mathematics, we get back this grid, and then what we need to do is take all the values out of this grid and read them and, and store them into a file somewhere. And this is where it gets cool, because you'd think we just go row, 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 no. We use a thing called the JPEG zigzag. We're gonna start here, and we're gonna read the values out like this, in this pattern. And there's a very good reason why we do this. If you look closely, in this example, we get to a certain point here, and everything left in that grid is zero. We can throw it all away with no loss of quality whatsoever. Bang. We've just cut, we've gone from 64 bytes of value in this down to about 10. We've ended up with a file that is a fraction of the size of the original image data. We write that file to disk, we send it over the network using all the stuff we talked about earlier, it goes flying around the world, it gets to the other end, we do all of those steps in reverse, we reconstitute that matrix, we plug all the missing zeros back in, we do the cosine transform, we get our three layers, we glue them back together, and there he is. And we've earned ourselves one, two, three beers, and probably enough money to get a bowl of chi to go with it. Which, by the way, is gonna be down at Rock City tonight if you don't know where the party is. So I hope to see you there. Now, the kind of thinking behind this talk, there's something that I want all of you to think about based on this. This has been a kind of real whirlwind tour through some of the most advanced technology ever, and it's technology that we all take for granted. But, you know, I get it, it's human nature. You make a Skype video call from the airport, and you don't think, wow, this is a miracle. You think, eh, the quality wasn't great. I wonder if I can get better signal, you know. Now, some of us are old enough to remember the first time we saw this stuff working, you know. First time I saw the Maps application running on an iPhone, it just blew me away. I'd never seen anything like it. First time I saw a Skype video call, blew me away. I'd never seen anything like it. And, you know, there are people who remember the first time they saw an automobile or an airplane. And there are probably people in this room who are like, hey, iPhone, big deal. We've had those my whole life. What, what's, what's all the fuss about? And what I'm really interested in, you know, when, when JPEG was first invented, I had a program that made JPEGs. It didn't display them, it couldn't display them, it didn't know how. You would literally, you'd take some, some images, some PCX files from Microsoft Paintbrush, and you'd run them through a converter that turned them into JPG files, and you had to send them to someone on a disk with the program to translate them, to decode them, because JPEG was such an obscure standard. You know, imagine nowadays downloading a photo from the web and having to download a separate program to convert it into something you could view. You know, it's, it, it, it's crazy. But that's how it started. All this stuff, radio networking, cellular data, JPEGs, MP3 files, all this stuff, not too long ago, it was prototypes. 
in laboratories that didn't work most of the time. And so what I'm interested in, what is the stuff out there right now that in 10 or 15 or 20 years is going to be ubiquitous and we'll all have one in our pocket? 3D printing, you know. Anyone here got a 3D printer? Yeah. Does it work? <laughs> yeah. Um, I know quite a lot of people who are into 3D printing as hobbies. I know a couple of companies who are doing like commercial 3D printing. Um, and when it works, it's brilliant. But when it doesn't work, there's an entire Flickr gallery of you know 3D printing failures and stuff. Um, but you know, imagine what's going to happen when it, it really works. Imagine you've got some people coming over for dinner, so you just print a bunch of plates. And you have dinner, and then you don't wash up. You just throw them in a hopper, and it recycles all the material. Imagine a game on your phone where you get to the end of a level. It prints you out a puzzle that you have to solve and scan it back in in order to proceed to the next level. Imagine a flight simulator game. You download to your computer, you press a button, and it prints out the controls, the throttle, the pedals, the joystick for the exact model of aircraft that you're simulating. You know, this is going to happen. And the people who invent it are going to be like, of course this was going to happen. And everyone else is going to be like, wow, how did they ever think of that? You know, autonomous vehicles. Everyone's looking at autonomous vehicles thinking, I'll be able to sit in my car and, you know, play on my phone and stuff. But that's not even... You know, imagine you could get a tiny little, like almost an autonomous bike to take you to a store to buy a sofa. And you buy a new sofa, and then you put your sofa in the back of a self-driving truck, and you say, go and play for a while. I'm going to go and meet my friends, watch a movie, have some beers. And you get home late night, you're like, oh, yeah, I bought a sofa. Tap your phone, and bang, it delivers the sofa. There, when you want it, not when the delivery people want it. You know. And how are we going to teach kids about traffic safety if they know that every single car is programmed to stop if it sees a child in the road? You know, look left, look right, look left, now just run out into traffic and watch all the trucks break. You know, someone's going to have to think about this. Someone's going to have to solve it. Is anyone here working on software developer tools? Anyone build, you know, plugins, IDEs, code editors? I know there's a couple of you here because I've ever heard some really cool conversation about it today. How's that going to get affected by things like VR and HoloLens? You know, how long before I can put on a set of goggles or some smart contact lenses and literally sit inside a running computer program or a network or a, a cluster of microservices and visualize the data flows like we could in Neuromancer, William Gibson's book about cyberspace, you know. That's coming. The reasons why we can't do it are the same reasons why my father had to send an envelope with a picture in it. It took four weeks to get around the world. We just haven't got the technology yet. Anyone wearing a conference name badge? Yeah, all of us are. Imagine they're virtual. You know, we've all got little contact lenses in. You can walk in, you can be like, you know what, I've only got half an hour. Bang. Filter out everyone who isn't hiring JavaScript developers. Show me all the people recruiting JavaScript devs. Give me their name. Give me salary expectations. I'll go and talk to the ones who look good. You know? We're not far off being able to do that. It sounds crazy, but you can make a list of the reasons why it's not possible yet and think, well, this company is solving that one. This company is solving that one. You see, something as trivial as getting Lionel here this isn't what they invented. They didn't sit down in a lab and go, we need a way of sending a cat wirelessly around the world. You know, This is not what drove the innovation. This is just a really cool, fun thing. It's silly. It makes me happy. It makes people laugh that it's possible now that we've solved and commoditized those technology, those uh, solutions and things. And I want to see what all of you here and all of us around the world are going to come up with when we've commoditized the next wave of technology and innovation. Oh, and uh, you know when I said Duolingo didn't teach me any useful Russian? It did actually last week come up with this. Sorry, Lionel. Spasiba. <laughs> Questions? In English, please. No questions. We have a question. Someone over there? Hi. Hi. Thanks. That was really nice. Um, the question is, what do you think would be the next sense that would be digitized? The touch or smell, or is it even possible? I think I think touch is a big one, and the reason why I think touch is a big one is because it actually has industrial applications. Um, you know, if you could invent uh, gloves, as immersive VR systems become more commonplace, 
the kind of uh, what they call haptic feedback that people get from working with their hands is going to become far more important for things like you know working in virtual environments, for enabling uh, remote surgery is one they love talking about, the idea that a surgeon can remotely connect to an operating theater. And for that kind of thing, you know, feedback is, is really, really important. Um, the other thing why I think touch is going to become a big one is because technology has shown us that anything you can use for pornography is going to sell. It worked for the printing press, it worked for video cassettes, it worked for cable TV, it worked for JPEGs. As soon as it's cheap enough, there's going to be a massive boom in that market. You know, I'm just observing, that's the way one of the drivers for the way technology has worked. But yeah, I think haptic feedback systems are going to be the next big thing. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink project? Have you heard of it? Uh, which one? Neuralink. Uh, Neuralink? Yeah. I've not heard of that one, but I'm going to guess from the name that it's about neural links. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, no, I've not heard of that one, but this is some kind of like, like telepathic thing. Um, it's interesting. I think we... We don't know nearly as much. If anyone kind of knows anyone or has read anything about people who have brain injuries and stuff, you realize we don't know anything like as much about the workings of the human brain as, you know, you watch Star Trek, they put them in a tricorder, it's like, oh, yeah, we can see exactly what's going on. You know, it's not like that. There was a, a panel uh, last year that um, someone in, in London convened where they wanted to talk about um, biohacking and, you know, people putting implants in their bodies and getting cybernetic limbs and stuff. And they said, we want to talk about this con the controversy around biohacking. So they got a couple of doctors, and they got a couple of you know, post-humanist and transhumanist enthusiasts. And they were like, oh, it's going to be cool. I'm going to print myself a robot arm. And these doctors are just like, this isn't even controversy. You have no idea how painful the rehabilitation from even the most minor surgery is. We are nowhere close yet to the idea where someone will voluntarily undergo any kind of surgical procedure unless they really, really have to. And I, I have a bunch of metal in my leg from a skiing accident. And the only reason I had it put there is because if I didn't have it put there, I wouldn't be able to walk. There's no way I'd do that on purpose just to have like an exoskeleton. It was really not much fun at all. And I think, you know, neural linking and that kind of stuff, people are working on it, but it's going to be a long, long time before we even know enough about human brains to make it a commodity. So. Uh, I, uh, hello. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, you provided an example of uh, how technologies are evolving. So I have a question for you. Uh, how do you estimate the speed of uh, how current technologies, especially VR, are evolving? Uh, you provided example as uh, uh, some HRs uh, can uh, hire uh, JavaScript developers using VR technologies. So mm -hmm. I ask question, when? How many years should we wait for this possibility? Two Five, years. ten, two? Actually, I'll tell you what, three years. Three years, I'll come back to CodeFest in 2021. I'll do a talk in Russian, and we can all wear smart contact lenses and find JavaScript developers. Deal? All right. Especially about CodeFest. I will be playing some tunes with my guitar down at Rock City later tonight, so I hope to see some of you down there. I'll be around. I'm doing another talk tomorrow. Thank you all very much for coming. Dosvidanya.